Welcome to everyone for our first in-person only event um, of the semester. And um, I, I think uh, we decided not to do Zoom because our, our speaker came all the way from Penn State. We figured uh, anybody at UVA could, could, could take, the, take the shorter distance to come join us and appreciate you coming. Of course, I really appreciate Greg uh, making the journey as well. Um, it turns out this, it's been 18 months since we had any in-person uh, out-of-town visitor um, event um, in the East Asia Center. So um, it's a cause for celebration. And it's a particular pleasure for me to host Greg uh, since it's given us a, ch us a chance to have a reunion of sorts um, after about 40 years. So back in the 1984-85, the two of us were both uh, assistant language teachers um, in Kumamoto Prefecture uh, the program now known as JET, and so uh, we saw uh, each other occasionally during that year. And then uh, he went off to do graduate study in Hawaii and Southern California. I went off to do graduate study in Oxford. And um, even though we both ended up in Appalachia of a sorts, the Appalachian foothills, um, since the 90s we've been teaching in our respective universities uh, we've only crossed paths once at an AAS conference, and so I'm really glad that we finally had an opportunity to bring him down from Penn State, where he has been professor of history um, since he started there in 1997. Um, Greg has written a series of books about the history of the Ryukyu Islands, the subject of his talk today, as well as the history of earthquakes and earthquake science in Japan. His two book books on earthquakes, Seismic Japan and When the Earth Roars, came out in 2013 and 2014 when the topic was hot for obvious reasons, but I figured he must have started on this project well before the Tohoku earthquake, and so that was a matter of fortuitous yeah. publication. Um, not so fortuitous for, for Fukushima. Um, so prior to, prior to his working on the earthquake project, he had written um, the book Visions of Ryukyu that came out in 1999, and he returned to the topic of Ryukyu history with his 2019 book, Maritime Ryukyu, 1050 to 1650. So today we're going to hear some of the research that came, uh, that went into that book, and some new, new material that he's been working on um, as he continues to study and write about uh, the Ryukyu island chain. Um, I think you're going to be interested not only in what he can tell us about the, the history of this region, but also in some of the innovative uh, methods he's been using, including new, new archaeological finds that he incorporates into uh, his historiography. So thank you very much, Greg. Look forward thank to your you talk. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for, for uh, being here. And, and it's just so nice to be doing uh, in-person talks, so I'd like to thank uh, Len and Brian for making this possible and for all the difficult logistics because I know that so many things uh, go into this. Uh, I'll stand back here without my mask so my boy breath can't possibly reach you. And uh, um, I'm going to um, read from a script because otherwise it can be dangerous. I'll just get going uh, and everything's connected to everything else and so you know, I wanted to keep it within the, the, the time period. Uh, so to kind of discipline myself, I'll read from the script. The problem is, can I do it without glasses? Uh, I'm here just in case. Uh, now I'm going to repeat just a little bit of what you heard, just going to contextualize my work, uh, some of the same things you've just heard. I'm, I'm a historian of Japan, broadly defined, uh, and my early research combined an interest in intellectual history with an interest in the Ryukyu Islands, and one result was the 1999 book, uh, Visions of Ryukyu. And that book uh, dealt with the 18th century and with um, royal ideology. And uh, at the time, I didn't realize this, but now looking back on it, um, it may. Um, I have to put the glasses on. Uh, this book probably also documents the earliest round of ethnogenesis in the Ryukyu Islands. Although that's that's a future topic that I'm going to tackle at some point in a very systematic way, I hope. Um, albeit an ethnogenesis limited uh, to elite people, uh, not ordinary people. Um, and if I were to rewrite the 1999 book, um, the, the middle chapters would all be the same, uh, but I would uh, recontext, uh, reframe it in the introduction and conclusion uh, based on what I now know uh, about 
uh, early Ryukyu in history. Um, having worked on Ryukyu since the 1980s, um, I became burned out on this topic, ready for something entirely different, and a fortuitous encounter with a seismologist uh, you know, introduced me to earthquakes. And so between 2005 and 2015, uh, that's when I was doing, that's my earthquake uh, decade. Uh, and um, but while I was working on earthquakes, there were scholars in, uh, based in different parts of Japan who were doing some very in innovative interdisciplinary work on early Ryukyuan history. Uh, so that's, you know, I'm, I'm not aware of that at the time, but then I, when I come back and I say, well, what, what's been happening in Ryukyuan history? And I discover uh, this fascinating, uh, innovative work, and that really hooks me in to, uh, to, to looking at early Ryukyu. Um, and I had long been suspicious of the typical survey history narrative about early Ryukyu. Um, many of the basic points of facts just didn't seem to add up. It seemed to be almost um, a larger, you know, like a, a too good to be true or miraculous kind of thing. Uh, and uh, so coming back after a decade away, I really, uh, I really eagerly absorbed uh, the recent literature and then I've just been going uh, uh, full speed ahead on this myself. Maritime Ryukyu 1050 to 1650 was my initial attempt to write a revisionist account of the uh, early, uh, wait, I'm here. I should have got that. I got, I got to get my act together here. There's the, those are the books. Uh, uh, so, um, it was my early attempt to write a, a revisionist account of early, the early history of the Ryukyu Islands. And among other points I, in, it, uh, in it, I argue that Ryukyu in history began in the northern Ryukyu Islands. In fact, here's the arguments, uh, some, of the, some of the arguments. That Ryukyu in history began in the northern Ryukyu Islands, not the island of Okinawa. And I'll, I'll talk about that in some more systematically. Uh, moreover, Okinawa's so-called three principalities, don't worry if you've never heard of them, uh, which supposedly existed from about 1314 to the 1420s, appear to have been uh, different brand names, different brand names of what was in effect a shipping corporation based at the port of Naha, not territorial states. Another finding. Uh, similarly, Okinawa's so-called first Sho dynasty, uh, these would be 15th century kings, you see them here, was uh, actually cobbled together in the 17th century, and not all of the kings were biological relatives. So in other words, in the 17th century, they all got lined up. And, uh, um, uh, so, uh, and, and another uh, thing about these early kings is that many of them were wako. And this is a term that's traditionally tra translated as Japanese pirates. And I'll say more about Wako later in the talk because they're very important. All right. So, uh, few of the arguments uh, in Maritime Ryukyu are entirely new, uh, and some go back as far as the 1930s in the Japanese literature. Uh, Maritime Ryukyu brings together findings in the Japanese literature from anthropology, archaeology, and linguistics, as well as traditional historical sources, uh, to create a new history of the region. And I'll talk more about sources also as we get going. Uh, the Ryukyu that appears in Maritime Ryukyu bears little or no resemblance to the still dominant image of Ryukyu among Anglophone readers, uh, which appears in the page of George Kerr's um, 1959 classic that you see here. So just to one example, uh, Kerr portrays the Ryukyu kingdom as a pacifist paradise, um, perhaps the only such society in the world um, that was utterly pacifist. Uh, and by contrast, maritime Ryukyu presents the archipelago as a rough and turbulent frontier region without any pacifism. Uh, in addition to advancing a variety of conclusions and arguments, in maritime Ryukyu, I note uh, several topics in need of further research. Uh, this needs more work, this needs more work, and I've been doing that work. I continued working on these topics, and the result is a recently completed manuscript draft, which I have tentatively entitled A New Model of Early Ryukyuan History, the same title as today's talk. So my talk today will include material from Maritime Ryukyu and from the recently completed manuscript. So, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with the region, uh, the Ryukyu Islands extend uh, 
in an arc between the island of Kyushu uh, and in the north to within sight of Taiwan in the south. So, uh, now, if you count some, at certain times these could conceivably be part of the Ryukyu Islands, but you know, mostly here or there. Um, <clears throat> and I'll show you a close up in just a second. Uh, <clears throat> There are approximately 160 islands in the Ryukyu chain, obviously most of them are missing uh, here, of which 49 are inhabited. Uh, today's Ryukyu islands are spread across two Japanese prefectures, Kagoshima and Okinawa, and the current population of the Ryukyu islands is somewhere between about 1.6 and 1.7 million, most of whom reside in the largest island of Okinawa, right there. Here's a more detailed look at the Ryukyu Islands. Throughout most of their history, sea lanes connected the Ryukyu Islands with the rest of the East China Sea region. So therefore, a general sense of regional geography is helpful for the topics that uh, I'm going to examine today. Uh, in addition uh, to the Ryukyu Islands themselves, areas of particular importance are the southern coast of Korea and the Korean island of Jeju. There. Um, the, um, so, so the Japanese islands of Tsushima and Iki, which linked the Korean Peninsula and northern Kyushu, um, and the, um, the coastal western Kyushu in general, and actually just all the way down. So this sort of this area here is uh, we'll be focusing a lot on that uh, in today's talk. Um, <clears throat> It's also helpful to take note of the size and location of the island of Okinawa. Uh, it's the largest of the Ryukyu Islands. Although in terms of sheer size, Amami Oshima is close, it's a close second, but you know, it's, it's even bigger than Amami Oshima there. Um, and, uh, um, and I want to emphasize that the Ryukyu Islands themselves are a, an arc of islands, uh, and that Okinawa is one island in the Ryukyu Islands, and there's a strong tendency to conflate these two things, to say Okinawa is meaning in all of this. Uh, but what I want to do is distinguish between that. There's a specific island of Okinawa, and then there are other Ryukyu Islands. So one of the things that I do in my recent research is to take those other Ryukyu Islands much more seriously uh, than, than people often do. And also, because the northern Ryukyu, Ryukyu Islands are today in Kagoshima Prefecture, right? So Kagoshima Prefecture is actually, from, uh, you can't see it, but uh, from Yoron all the way on up, uh, there's a tendency to kind of just forget about them uh, in, in modern or contemporary accounts. But it's actually in the northern Ryukyu Islands uh, that Ryukyu in history, in many uh, senses, begins. Uh, and uh, you know, so there was a time when this was a flourishing and vigorous area, and Okinawa was a relative backwater. And I'll get to uh, that as well. Um, so let me show you the periodization scheme. Uh, that uh, it's partly mine. And so this, the scheme shown here includes some conventional time periods, as well as some that I have modified based on my research. And my talk today will focus on the uh, so-called Gusaku era in bold here. Um, <coughs> which is characterized, among other things, by a large-scale migrations into the Ryukyu Islands by people from Japan and, to a lesser extent, coastal Korea. And it's during the 11th century that the Ryukyu Islands became Japonic in terms of population, language, and many other aspects of culture. Uh, but, as uh, hopefully we will see uh, today, the story is a little bit more complicated than that. Than that. Um, my current manuscript begins with the earliest human remains found in the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, that's a, a model of them. Um, and for that matter, in all of Japan, it's the oldest remains anywhere in the Japanese islands broadly defined. Two leg bone fragments from a young girl that are uh, between 32,000 and possibly as old as 36,000 years old. Uh, um, and the narrative in, in the recent manuscript continues with the establishment, and it goes up to the establishment of a centralized state roughly in the 1530s. I don't really dwell on the leg bones all that long, but you know. Um, uh, so that's the, the current manuscript has this very, very broad sweep. I'm trying to, sh to, to document 
every group of people in, that was ever in which island that we can possibly detect, uh, starting with the leg bone and moving uh, forward from there. Um, and so in the q and I'll be happy to talk about, to address any questions or comments you might have about any period of Ryukyu in history. I've worked on the modern era as well. Uh, so you know, if, if you want to talk about something outside of this time period, that's fine uh, as well. From the mid-14th, put the slides here. From the mid-14th century onward, a few Buddhist priests from Japan and some merchants from southern China lived in the Ryukyu Islands, typically as temporary <coughs> residents. Um, these people took care of whatever correspondence was necessary for trade purposes. However, there is no evidence of written documents being used in connection with any domestic government administration until the 1500s, actually until well into the 1500s, like 1520s and 30s. Therefore, to understand who migrated into and who dwelled within the Ryukyu Islands at different points in the distant past uh, requires using other types of physical evidence. So, let us now consider a relatively simple and revealing example that consists mainly of rocks and trees. Some rocks and trees as historical um, evidence. Of course, not just any old rocks and trees. All right, so now, let's take a look. Um, <clears throat> these photos come from the Korean island of Jeju, as well as mainland South Korea. Uh, notice the simple rock walls surrounding prominent trees, or in the upper right example, a small grove of trees atop a high point in the landscape. Uh, some of the trees are encircled by hemp rope, and some have pieces of clothing hanging from their branches. This is the clothing here. Um, <clears throat> uh, offerings of fruit are found in some locations, and if any structure is present other than the stone fence, it is small and simple. Uh, these are a type of sacred grove uh, known generically as Dong or Dongsan, and with the term, the latter term just means Dong Mountain. Um, so, uh, among other things, cutting or, bre or breaking branches of anything growing in, in this, these groves uh, is prohibited. The deity will be very upset with you if you do that. Rites at these groves are typically conducted by women. Uh, men may be present at sacred grove rites, but they do not officiate at them. Okay. So that's Jeju Island and southern Korea. And now let's go across, straight across the sea to western uh, Japan. We'll, we'll look at western Honshu. Um, so these photos come from coastal southwest Honshu, the uh, area colored pink in the map right there. Um, <clears throat> they are sacred groves, generically called Niso no Mori, uh, and the term Mori in this context uh, means grove, so we could just call them Niso groves. Uh, and uh, these groves have the same or very similar appearance to the Korean Dong, and they have many of the same characteristics. Niso no Mori are community shrines. Outsiders are prohibited from entering the groves, not legally, but spiritually. In local lore, the grove deity will inflict punishment on unauthorized people who enter, or on anyone who cuts or breaks twigs or branches. Um, as in Korean Dong, uh, the deity of each grove is different. The grove has a unique deity, and it's usually imagined as the spirit of the founding ancestor of a local community. So let's move into Kyushu now. Um, and we'll go down to, to Kagoshima Prefecture, uh, the Satsuma Peninsula. Uh, right, so s similar groves to what we've just seen are found, by the way, in, in the islands of Iki and Tsushima and throughout western Kyushu. In Kagoshima Prefecture in southwest Kyushu, there are sacred groves known, known as Moidon, uh, literally venerable grove. Um, you, you might have heard of it, like Saigo Takamori is Seigo Don in Kagoshima. It's the same Don, Tono. So Moi Don, uh, uh, Venerable Groves, um, uh, and they have almost the same qualities as the Korean Dong, or the Niso no Mori, uh, of southwestern Honshu. The object of veneration is usually an impressive tree, and the deity residing in and around that tree is quick to take offense, breaking branches or other things. Moi Don often uh, contain ancient grave sites, and these graves are uh, thought to be those of community founders or their descendants. Um, 
right? So very similar rows. And let's just keep going south now. Let's set off from Kagoshima Bay uh, right here and head down into the Ryukyu Islands. And if we were to do that, by the way, it's not, it's fairly easy. You don't need complicated navigation. Um, because if we were to sail in a small ship, um, the navigation from Kagoshima Bay would, all the way to Okinawa would not be difficult. In good weather, we could sail as far as Okinawa by island hopping with the next island always in sight over the bow and the previous one in sight over the stern. And indeed, historically, there was much movement across this maritime zone, in part because it was very easy to do. So now we're heading down to Okinawa. It's just off of this map. Um, and, uh, here we are. One of the iconic features of classical Ryukyuan culture, not just Okinawa itself, but all the Ryukyu Islands, is a type of sacred grove known generically as utaki, a uh, term literally meaning venerable mountaintop. Um, the examples here are typical. Uh, these Ryukyuan sacred groves closely resemble Korean Dong, as well as sacred groves located in southwestern Japan. Note the stone walls, the tangled growth of trees, the lack of structures other than a simple box like alcove, uh, in, in just in some cases. In some Okinawan groves, men are prohibited from entering, and in all cases, it is women who perform rites at the groves. Uh, cutting branches or removing anything from uh, the groves is likely to in incur the censure of the deity who is imagined to be the spirit of the original community founder or perhaps the spirit of a locally prominent person. Most Ryukyuan sacred groves are also burial sites, or if they were burial sites, uh, or were located right next to burial sites. So these Ryukyuan Say, What is some iconic feature of classical Ryukyuan culture? Utaki would be certainly something that comes to mind. And I want to just, you know, again, some of you would know this, but just in case, um, I just want to emphasize these are not Shinto shrines. That's a whole different thing. Um, during the 20th century, for political reasons, a few groves did acquire tori, uh, the distinctive gateway, the uh, uh, shrine gateway that you see here on the left. But otherwise, shrines and groves are almost entirely different, both in appearance and function. Shrines, for example, often feature elaborate buildings. Uh, they are not associated with burials or funerals. Um, the shrine priests are men. Uh, also, it is common for the same deity to have multiple shrines uh, in Japan. For example, there are some 30,000 or so shrines uh, throughout the Japanese islands dedicated to the deity Inari. This is one example. By contrast, each sacred grove houses a unique deity. So they're, not, they're not Shinto shrines. There were some people uh, who hypothesized that they were a proto-Shinto shrine that has been early debunked by scholarship. So, now let's zoom out. There we have it. This map indicates the geographic distribution of sacred groves as well as the most common names for each groves in different locations. So you see a bunch of different names here. Um, the, the, with their, the underlined items are names of groves in those locations. Despite the different names, most groves share a common appearance and set of characteristics. Mapping Important cultural, just in general, mapping important cultural phenomena in the Ryukyu Islands often produces a similar geographic pattern. Uh, it doesn't always extend up here, but, but this part for sure is very common. Um, <clears throat> the sacred grove zone uh, corresponds with other evidence that we have of movement of people throughout this region, and careful dating of the groves uh, indicates that they originated in Korea. In other words, the oldest ones are in, uh, in Korea. The groves spread to southwestern Japan and the Ryukyu Islands via the activity of seafarers, uh, many of whom we, uh, are folks we would call wako. I'll talk about them. And not surprisingly, these seafarers took their religious culture with them in their travels. So in many ways, these groves map out movement of wako throughout the uh, area. So now I want to talk about wako just a little bit because that's often a poorly understood topic. Um, so this image you see here is the stereotypical image, and it's not wrong, it's just that it's not the whole picture. Uh, the term wako is conventionally translated as Japanese pirates, uh, but the translation is only partially accurate. Uh, wako engaged in smuggling and marauding, <coughs> to be sure, but they also engaged in conventional trade. 
And conversely, maritime merchants at this time were always armed, and they sometimes engaged in smuggling or raiding. Uh, so there was no sharp dividing line between lawful merchant seafarers and lawless ones. It often depended on circumstances. Wako bases were located mainly in coastal Japan and nearby islands such as the Ryukyu Islands. That is, in places that lacked a strong central state. If you think about these, this era, uh, the reason we, we call them Wako, Japanese pirates, is they're based in Japan if there's no strong central state. Uh, moreover, especially during the 13th and 14th century, many Wako were Korean, or people of mixed Korean and Japanese ancestry. Some estimates are as high as half, although some would give different estimates. Uh, Wako were the major drivers, were major drivers of early Ryukyuan history. And that's something that is typically lacking in you know, the, the, the standard uh, narratives of Ryukyuan history. Right. Um, one argument in maritime Ryukyu is that from the 11th century through the start of the 17th, uh, the Ryukyu Islands were not a self-contained entity. Uh, in the recent manuscript, I make the same argument, but I start roughly 35,000 years ago. Um, much of the sacred grove zone overlaps a region that in maritime Ryukyu I call the East China Sea Network. Uh, the Ryukyu Islands were an integral part of this network, and it was western Kyushu and southern Korea. Uh, they were also uh, part of this network, so you see the, the, the zone here. Um, with this point in mind as, as background, uh, let us now consider two different models of early Ryukyu history. We'll get into the first, the old model that's still the dominant one, and then the one I'm I and others uh, would propose. All right, so the old and still dominant model might be called, this is my term, the seed population model. According to this view, in ancient times, some people migrated to the island of Okinawa, uh, mostly from Kyushu, most likely from Kyushu. Uh, they did not necessarily come in a single ship, but they, it was a small group and they arrived within a relatively narrow time period, perhaps the 10th or 11th centuries. Uh, like a seed, this group took root in Okinawa, especially in southern Okinawa. Uh, this scenario corresponds to the mythical origins of Okinawa that you would find in the official histories of the Ryukyu Kingdom. In these official histories, uh, which were created, as I'll explain, uh, in the early modern era, um, in these accounts, uh, a deity called Amamiku, or Amamikyo, came into Okinawa from the north and established sacred groves things we were just looking at, um, in several locations, mostly in the southern part of the island. This is phase one. So either in the you know, like secularized version, which posits something like this, or in which corresponds to the mythological, mythological version that was written down in the uh, official histories, which posits something like this. Um, you know, either way, it's pretty much the same story. That's phase one, and in phase two, seed population prospers. Um, prospered uh, and grew, and this seed population created an agricultural society rooted in southern Okinawa. Uh, agricultural surpluses, in this view, were the driving force between a steady increase, in, the driving force that caused a steady increase in social complexity. It's the standard thing you've heard probably. Agriculture gets started, flourishes, social complexity increases. That's the typical story, and the result was the rise of local warlord territories, and then small principalities, and eventually a glorious kingdom. This kingdom was the Ryukyu kingdom and its creation from such an unlikely source, that is the resource-poor land of Okinawa, uh, was almost miraculous. And indeed, uh, the word uh, miraculous literally appears in some of the academic literature, with one recent example shown here. In this model, the other Ryukyu Islands were big players. Um, they became part of the Ryukyu Kingdom by conquest, uh, but the part about conquest tends to be minimized in the standard uh, story in favor of an assumption that Okinawan culture is synonymous with Ryukyuan culture in general, and it was only natural that the island of Okinawa controls the rest of the Ryukyu Islands. I'll, of course, have a different view of that. Um, 
Now, before we go on, though, just speaking of miracles, here's another example. Here's another example of an alleged, alleged miraculous nature of early Ryukyuan history, this time with respect to the relationship between Okinawa and the Ming Dynasty in China. And this relationship is often imagined as one of mutual admiration and friendship, which, if true, does seem miraculous. Uh, in maritime Ryukyu, however, I argue that the reason the Ming Dynasty extended favorable trade terms to certain Okinawan warlords uh, was an attempt to buy off pirates, that is, to make lawful trade more profitable than smuggling or marauding. Uh, moreover, the, re the relationship between the Ming, uh, Chinese Ming Dynasty uh, and the powers within the Ryukyu Islands was fraught with tensions and problems for centuries. And in Maritime Ryukyu, you can read about that in, in lots of detail if you're, if you're interested. Um, so, from where did this Okinawa-centric, quasi-miraculous model originate? Um, and the Proximate Modern Route is a popular book by Takara Kurayoshi. Heard of him? He's a personal friend of mine. Um, at least he was. I mean, he might not like anything you're hearing today, but but I uh, mean, really, uh, you know, I hate you know to say anything negative about his work. But anyway, he wrote this popular book in 1980 called Ryukyu no Jidai Oi Naru Rekishizo Megute, or The Era of Ryukyu in Search of the Big Historical Picture. Um, right, so that's the proximate source of this model. Uh, but it has deeper roots. The deeper roots of this model are the official histories of the Ryukyu Kingdom, uh, which were written between approximately 1650 and 1750. So you have the specific works here in order. Um, <clears throat> Most modern survey histories rely, to a fault, I would say, on these works. Informed by classical Chinese historiography, the official histories present Yuqiu's story as a morality play, in which righteousness ultimately prevails. Um, and uh, with some modification and adjustment for, to fit modern conceptions of cultural or ethnic identity, the same basic format has informed most modern histories of Yuqiu. In other words, yeah, it's not exactly the same as this, but this sets this, forms the basic framework. So now at this point, I'd like to, uh, to spend a moment looking at this term Ryukyu Kingdom. Very popular and common term. Uh, just problematize it slightly. Um, so perusing the titles of the many modern and contemporary surveys of Ryukyu in history, it's striking how often the term Ryukyu Okoku that is, Ryukyu Kingdom, appears in both the titles and the cover art. In recent decades, the mantra-like intoning of this Ryukyu Kingdom has become the norm in much of the literature, uh, you know, the, the written literature about Ryukyu. Uh, but it's important to bear in mind that this term is mainly used in the island of Okinawa. So I can just in, right now, you know, as people might talk about this. Um, there, and, and there, it is closely connected with tourism. Uh, the term is also very common in the Anglophone lit literatures. And I confess to having contributed to that usage in my younger days. Something I would change if I were going to rewrite that 1999 book. Um, I would qualify it. Uh, now, to be sure, I'm not saying there wasn't a kingdom. Uh, from the 1370s, there was a sizable group of people residing in Okinawa who Chinese records call Wong, so there's a Chinese word, Wong, and we always translate that word as king in English. It's just automatic. Yeah. Um, they, they, they don't mean the same things completely. Um, right? so, and in addition to these Wong, or kings, that were there were multiple of them in Okinawa from the 1370s, uh, from about 1500 or soon thereafter, certainly from the 1520s, <coughs> Uh, we, we find a strong centralized state it develops in Okinawa. It's based in southern Okinawa in Shuri, which is near the port of Naha. And the head of this state was a king. So from the early 1500s onward, the Ryukyu Islands were indeed a kingdom, more or less in the modern English sense of the term. So it's, again, it's not like it didn't exist, but I'm trying to 
explain that there's a little more to it than just that. Um, and this gets back to the point that Okinawa does not equal the Ryukyu Islands. Outside of the island of Okinawa, the term Ryukyu Kingdom would today be understood by people. Uh, it would not, however, carry positive overtones for people familiar with local history. The term um, Ryukyu Kingdom has a relatively benign ring to it, you know, English or in Japanese, uh, but it is important to bear in mind that this kingdom was also an empire. Uh, it was created by military force, held together by military force, and its central government extracted heavy taxes from those living within its territories. Other islands occasionally tried, without success, to break away from Okinawan control. Shown here is one of the more famous local heroes of that resistance, uh, Oyake Akahachi of Ishigaki in southern Ryukyu Islands. And in the year 2000, the city of Ishigaki uh, sponsored an event to mark the 500th anniversary of his death. He died in 1500. Uh, and this event has developed since 2000 into an annual Akahachi Festival. This guy is wildly popular still to this day in the southern Ryukyu Islands. Um, <clears throat> so, in Maritime Ryukyu, I devote two chapters to explaining, to examining aspects of the Ryukyuan Empire. Uh, this discussion includes putting some of the major literature about empires in general into dialogue with the circumstances of the Ryukyu Islands during the 16th century. More recently, the National Museum of Japanese History has taken up this same perspective. And I did slip a copy of Maritime Ryukyu to one of the together. Um, the exhibition here is uh, entitled Maritime Empire Ryukyu, the Middle Ages from the Perspective of Yaeyama, Miyako, and Amami. In other words, from the perspective of Ryukyu Islands other than Okinawa. Look at sources. The Ryukyu Kingdom's official histories, as I mentioned, are problematic. And furthermore, very few uh, written documents were produced within the Ryukyu Islands before the 16th century. So, what other sources are there? Official records from China and Korea are useful, very useful, uh, as is a collection of diplomatic and trade records called Nekidai Hoan, in Japanese pronunciation. And these sources have been well mined for decades. Um, in my view, significant forward progress in early Ryukyuan history depends especially on findings from other disciplines, such as literature, linguistics, geography, anthropology, and especially archaeology. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, innovative interdisciplinary scholarship has been published in Japan, one example of which is shown here. Um, and of particular importance in, in this is the use as historical sources of religious and folk songs found in the collection called Omoro Soshi. Here we have a, a raw page for uh, this is one song from the Omoro Soshi collection. It's, uh, there, there are uh, approximately 15,000 songs. Uh, it's like 1,500 songs. Two generations of scholars have worked on interpreting Omoro Soshi songs, and their labor has created the foundation, or a foundation for using these songs uh, as, as, for example, one alternative to the official histories, uh, as tools for reading the official histories against the grain, and as supplements to the work of anthropologists and archaeologists. So the Omoro Soshi, and that's the big, uh, the big breakthrough, was when people started to really rigorously use it, in, in the sense of saying, you know, this also correlates to this archaeological find, and we find this uh, a name for this place name in an Omoro song and in an ancient Korean map and, and you start to get a whole network. Uh, so this book, although the main title is Wako in the Ryukyu Kingdom, it's really about the subtitle. What does the Omoro Soshi tell us about, about history? The new, the new model of... <laughs> slides quite too quickly. Just as the seed population narrative was becoming popular in the early 1980s, archaeology began to challenge it. Uh, in 1983, for example, researchers discovered the first of what would eventually become the remains of over 100 kilns on the northern Ryukyu island of Tokunoshima. Um, these kilns were of Korean design, and they produced high-quality earthenware known as kamuyaki. Uh, 
Uh, starting in 2003, excavation of the Gusku site group on the tiny northern Ryukyu island of Kikaijima eventually revealed a massive trade center that had been in operation since about the 10th century. By 2006, if not earlier, it had become clear that the history of the Ryukyu Islands did not start in Okinawa. So, the new model of early Ryukyu history that I uh, propose, relying on many other people's work, I, I should add, it's not like I just came up with this, um, uh, uh, is more complex than you can probably tell from the currently dominant one. In the new model, the main drivers of the history of the Ryukyu Island were waves of people who came from outside the islands, that come into the islands from somewhere else, often as the result of military and political upheavals within the region. These people included traders from Japan and Korea, who set up an enormous base of operations in the tiny northern island of Kikaijima during the 10th and 11th centuries. They also include defeated warrior and wako groups um, who supported the southern court in Japan's conflict between the northern and southern courts in the, back in the medieval era. Uh, in the four, mainly in the 14th century. They also include Mongols and Alans fleeing China after the Yuan dynasty began to collapse in the late 14th century, and people fleeing Korea and uh, as the, just a little bit later as the Goryeo dynasty collapsed uh, a little bit later in that century. Indeed, the first person to appear in Chinese records as holding the title Long, or King, uh, in Okinawa almost certainly came from Korea. Uh, or Shohashi, the person typically credited with unifying Okinawa under a single king, and I, I might add that, that I would regard that as inaccurate, um, came from Sashiki in Korea. Founded Sashiki in Okinawa. And Sashiki is, is right near Yatsushiro. The big city today. The deepwater port of Naha in Okinawa also functioned as a regional center for human trafficking, and all of the Ryukyu Islands were home to Wako, uh, at least as important as the people, any people we could name, were groups of, uh, whose presence in the Ryukyu Islands is attested by pottery, skeletal remains, and other physical evidence. Among scholars writing in English, uh, archaeologist Richard Pearson has, in his recent work, argued that it was mainly people from outside the Ryukyu Islands who created early Ryukyuan societies and cultures. So at least Richard Pearson would also be, you know, at least roughly, in this new model of advocate. This new model situates the Ryukyu Islands within the East China Sea and examines the diverse peoples who migrated to and through the various islands. Moreover, these islands were trading and raiding societies, not agricultural societies. That's an argument I make in gory detail in the next, in the recently completed manuscript. I actually have to simplify that a little bit. Um, and to repeat an earlier point, they were never isolated, at least not until the early 17th century. That was a big change. Okay. Now, um, we've seen uh, sacred groves. If you were to say, what were the iconic features of early Ryukyuan culture, almost anybody would either name sacred groves or these stone-walled fortresses called Gusku. So, sacred groves and stone-walled fortresses called Gusku. Um, there's all kinds of theories as to how that name came about. Uh, are emblematic manifestations of classical Ryukyuan culture. Scholars have argued about Gusku since at least the early 1960s, what's called the Gusku Ronso. And any comprehensive treatment of the topic is beyond our scope here. But let's just consider the know-how for their construction, uh, the technology. Gusku predate uh, the classical early modern Japanese stone castles by well over a century. And in any case, Gusku don't resemble these mainland Japanese castles. Gusku were built in high places, and they incorporate the contours of the land into their construction. So, from where did the know-how to build them come? Like sacred groves, or the technology for kamuyaki earthenware, Yukuan stone-walled gusku came from Korea. Uh, not the stone itself, of course, but the idea, the designs, the technologies uh, for processing the stone and making it into impressive fortress walls. There were once approximately 2,400 stone fortresses in the Korean peninsula, and there were hundreds of stone gusku uh, 
uh, in the Ryukyu Islands. And by the way, there's also a different type of Ryukyu that don't have stone walls, but let's uh, worry about that. Like sacred groves, Ryukyu and stone gusuku closely resemble their Korean counterparts in most respects. And I've looked at hundreds of photos of this. Uh, several larger Okinawan gusuku, typically called castles, you get big enough, they're calling castles, uh, included structures with roof tiles made from Okinawan clay, but which were otherwise nearly exact copies of Korean roof tiles. One, uh, one of these sites, Urasoe Castle, was home to a group of seafarers who came to Okinawa from Korea in about 1350. They disappeared rather suddenly amidst fierce warfare during the 1390s, but at least one of them made it back to Korea and appears there in official records. Korean style mountain fortresses were also built in mainland Japan, mostly in northern Kyushu. Um, <clears throat> however, they are much older than the Ryukyuan examples, um, and in the Japanese case it was refugees from the Korean kingdom of, kingdom of Baekje who oversaw the construction of these fortresses in the 7th and 8th centuries, so way, way back. Um, so, therefore, it's remotely possible that, that the design of Ryukyu and Gusuku reflects some indirect Japanese influence, or Korean Japanese influence. Um, however, the Korean-style fortresses in, in uh, Japan had long been in disuse by the time that the stonewalled Gusuku appeared during the 12th and 13th century within the Ryukyu Islands. <coughs> it's even less likely China was the source for this Ryukyuan fortress technology because Chinese castles are typically built from bricks uh, and were situated in plains or other flatlands. An entirely different design. Uh, moreover, few Chinese people traveled to or resided in the Ryukyu Islands. This is an important point. The flow of people is constantly in this direction, uh, and uh, there was a little bit in this direction, but not much. Um, <clears throat> in short, all indications are that the stonewalled Gusku or another Korean technological and cultural contribution to the Ryukyu Islands. One argument that I advanced to some extent in maritime Ryukyu, and much more thoroughly in the recent manuscript, is that the Korean peninsula was a major source of early Ryukyuan culture, and to a lesser extent of, of people. Um, the main link was Wongo, the marauding and trading seafarers who brought many Koreans to the Ryukyu Islands in connection with human trafficking. But moreover, as you, you may recall, Wako ranks themselves included many Korean people. That's why the Wako raids against the Korean coast were so effective. Uh, and uh, uh, written accounts by shipwrecked Koreans who passed through the Ryukyu Islands uh, indicate the presence of Korean communities in the Naha area as late as the middle of the 15th century. Like the actual communities of Korean people that have been verified by uh, Korean travelers. Mm. Another uh, point that um, I emphasize is that until the 17th century, the Ryukyu Islands were part of broader regional networks of trade and migration. I've actually said that many times, but that's obviously an, an important point. Uh, yeah, the, so, in the recent manuscript, I propose a hub-and-spoke model as the best way to make sense of the trade and cultural exchanges within the East China Sea region. So shown here is a relatively simple iteration of that model in the 11th and 12th centuries. If you move into the 13th and 14th, it gets much more complicated. So I used a relatively simple one, because that's that way it's easy to see. Um, so, um, this hub and spoke model is useful both for understanding early Ryukyuan history and it's also probably applicable to pre modern trade in other regional contexts. And you can move it around so we can make uh, like Ningbo a, a, a major port here. That could become a, a major hub and then you'd have a different configuration of spokes and such. So, in the diagram shown here, the two hubs were the port of Hakata in northwest Kyushu, today's Fukuoka city as well as the northern Ryukyu Islands of Kikaijima, Amami Oshima, and Tokunoshima. I, I, my, a term I came up with was Northern Tier Islands for this group. Um, <clears throat> Korean trade ceramics and other products from, from Korea came into the Ryukyu Islands, typically in Hakata, uh, but also possibly uh, via a, a more direct route. Chinese trade ceramics and other products came into the Ryukyu Islands via Hakata. All right, so 
here. here. Um, um, <clears throat> but it is also possible that Chinese ships occasionally stopped uh, in the region of Motai Matsu, right there, um, in southern Kyushu on their way to Hakata. So they would actually travel often by island hopping. There's some pretty good evidence that they would stop here sometimes and do some business before going on uh, to Hakata. Uh, so in one way or another, and often in multiple ways, the Ryukyu Islands were linked into the coast of China, the Japanese island of Kyushu, and thus you know, the rest of the Japanese islands, and southern Korea. Now, the Ryukyu, just a little bit about the economics, the Ryukyu Islands themselves provided valuable marine and tropical products, including several types of seashells that were valuable, the raw material for making mother of pearl, which comes from one particular type of seashell that has a very limited distribution. Um, sea turtle shells, palm fronds, and redwood, just to name the most, a few of the major items. Uh, their location, or the island's location, was also ideal for trading posts. Um, and from the 13th century onward, Okinawa, the island of Okinawa, shown here, uh, gradually developed into a major hub, while the northern Ryukyu Islands uh, faded in relative importance to Okinawa. So we get into the 13th century, and this is going to change. This circle is going to become bigger. It's going to become a major hub, and this is going to shrink. Um, so not only was the region interconnected, it was dynamic. Specific locations prospered or declined based on changing geopolitical and economic circumstances. Just right. Discipline myself. The script. All right, so finally, zooming out and looking at the, the, the larger picture, and there's actually many ways to zoom out and look at the larger picture. Um, I would say the early history of the Ryukyu Islands is fascinating, a fascinating story of diverse peoples and cultures coming into some or all of the islands. Uh, some of these folks, uh, such as the Jomon and Austronesian peoples, um, and the Austronesian people, by the way, were mostly in the southern Ryukyu Islands, but they also got into the northern ones, uh, I argue in the upcoming manuscript. Uh, the, at least in the case of the Austronesian peoples, some aspect of their culture survived and persisted even into the 20th century. Uh, just to name three examples, include the, some origin myths whereby humans came from a primordial hermit crab didn't know that humans came from the great hermit crab. And that's southern, that's Southeast Asian mythology, it's Austronesian. Um, and, and that's very prominent in the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, a, a distinctive treading cultivation for red rice, the red rice itself and the way of cultivating it by having um, animals tread the fields. Uh, it comes uh, as an Austronesian custom coming from, up from Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, the practice of postpartum sweat baths for mothers and babies. Like, literally cooking the mother and baby. Uh, uh, that is another, another Austronesian custom. There are many others, but those are some well-known ones. Um, so um, this basically lays it out. Uh, there were people, of course, even earlier, like that leg bone. Uh, but in terms of people we can actually trace from their remains and pottery and things like that, we have these groups. Uh, and then the, this Gusku era is this major dis, disjunction where the previous populations here have shrunk to a very small number, and then you get this big influx from uh, up north and the Japanese islands, and to some extent from Korea, uh, coming in and going forward. Then you have Japonic Ryukyu, uh, which, but then also receives influxes from all sorts of political disruptions of the region. And you get this very complicated and fascinating story that's very simply described here in this uh, chart. And notice that the central state is pretty far off in this. For all, all, most of the time there is no central state. And then at some point I'm going to try to map, pull down exactly when we find ethnogenesis and how we define it and what happens and things like that. So anyway, I will stop uh, at this point. I could ramble on forever and ever, but I figure you've got questions and comments and you know it doesn't have to be this time period. It can be anything else. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, for that right now. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah.
Um, I have a question that corresponds to one your favorite um, map that showed all the different arrivals in in uh, different time periods. Can you put that slide up there? Okay. So um, it was also your cover slide. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so let's go up to the very top. Oh, we're, we're, we're. There, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering which of those colored arrows actually fits the original seed story that right. that became the dominant narrative. You're saying it's much more complex, but at least one of these possibly mm -hmm. supports the old story. And I just wondered if you can hone in on that. Actually, none of them do because the old story... It, it, okay. Here's why. I mean, it, the old story is that a group from probably Kyushu, probably northern Kyushu, but some people would argue maybe a little bit like in the Yamaguchi area or something, so based on usually on linguistic uh, evidence, that a group from here, not just one ship, but you know, some ships and, uh, over a century or so, 10th, most likely 11th century, came down to Okinawa and settled there and then spread outward from there. But notice that. The, uh, sorry, I'm pointing to I'm pointing to a long ocean. Uh, all right, here's Okinawa. They come down to Okinawa, okay. and that's the problem: is that the earliest uh, vigorous activity in the Ryukyu Islands is actually <coughs> um, and it's in it's, it, if, of all things, it's on this tiny little island of Kikai, um, where the s biggest s trade facility ever excavated <laughs> anywhere in this whole zone by far was located. That, was, that seems to have been the administrative hub. The pottery was produced across, uh, in, this, is, this map is a little bit, uh, not, it's actually more like a cross, in Tokonoshima. And Amami Oshima itself provided the lumber and everything for the kilns and the iron works and things like that. Yeah, but that's, so, so that would be the earliest right there, the blue. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's a northern Ryukyu Island story. And Okinawa is a relative backwater. In fact, we um, just don't, very little happening there. Some people there, but not not much happening. The blue zone. The, the, uh, so then, when Okinawa then begins to prosper, that would correspond uh, to roughly the uh, the 13th century or so. Yes. Well, there's many, but I'll that I then stop. Uh, have there been any genetic work on those 2,000 year old legs? Um, I don't actually know if there's been genetic work on the leg bones. Uh, the, the, uh, if, if, if that was possible, there surely would have been, because uh, that's the, the thing everyone wants to do, is to find some human remains and then try to get uh, genetic data on them. The, the laboratory techniques keep getting better, so they can often go back and, and test old samples that didn't work, and sometimes then it works. Uh, but um, the, the difficulty with physical remains, well, just in this, the classic anthropo, uh, you know, like when you, you do physical anthropology, but it's all the more so with genetic evidence, is um, the climate is so um, the hot, humid climate. It just rots away human remains, um, and then there's the problem of cross contamination with DNA evidence. So um, uh, the initial rounds of DNA evidence were very unsatisfactory. Um, it was really hard to get anything out of it, but they've gotten better and better and better. And the part of the body that really seems to work well are the teeth. And that's kind of shelters the, the, you know, the DNA is, is preserved within the tooth. So probably the leg bone just isn't suitable. I, I don't know that for absolutely for sure, but I, um, I've seen no evidence that there's any uh, genetic uh, data that's come out of the, that leg bone. Um, but there has been a lot of work with teeth. Uh, and it keeps getting better and better in the sense of we tested 16 teeth and 14 of them, you know, we were actually able to get mDNA. Uh, uh, anyway. uh, so uh, the genetic evidence is getting better and better, but it's still, it's still what it tends to do is to form, uh, give us a broad framework. Uh, and to date things with more precision, we usually have to go with the archaeological evidence. Yes. Um, so did the Okinawan language sort of reflect these Korean and Taiwanese influences? And then can you also touch on like the state of the modern Okinawan language with respect to Korean and Japanese? Yes. All right. So 
uh, and uh, so if you were to uh, go to Okinawa and speak Southern Okinawan, if you specify that, because Northern Okinawan it would not be understandable, um, uh, like in Naha, well, no one would understand you. <laughs> it's sort of like going to Hawaii and speaking Hawaiian. Um, so, yeah, there might be someone who would understand you, and you know, if you looked long enough. So it's it's a language that's not dead, but it is. Um, people are worried that it's going to become dead, and it's it's enjoying a revival almost out of desperation, but initially. But then, you know, as it as it revives, you know, people find it you know, as a, a compelling thing uh, to study. So you can, you can find Okinawan language um, classrooms and so forth in Okinawa today, or even in, in Hawaii. Um, the, it, it's, and it's based on the Okinawan that was spoken in the Shuri Naha area. Um, so the uh, Japonic languages, and this, this is a term that linguist a guy, a guy named Leon Seraphim uh, coined, and he was tremendously helpful in maritime Ryukyu. Uh, I mean, I, I absolutely you know, thank you, Leon, a thousand times over, because uh, I just shudder to think of the poor handling of the linguistic evidence that I was doing you know, until he came along and straightened me out. In my next book, I actually don't do linguistic evidence because Leon isn't there. To, you know. uh, but anyway, the, so the, he coined the term Japonic languages, which is it, all the other linguists have taken up and said, this is a great term. That means from Yonaguni all the way up to Hokkaido, and you know, uh, there, there's all these different Japonic languages, so Japonic language family. And so the Ryukyuan languages are part of that Japonic language family. There is... Um, a, 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 a both a biological, like in terms of plants and animals, like different flora and fauna, gap right about here, and also the, the Kuroshio current comes flowing through here in a very strong way. Um, and there's also kind of a linguistic gap where you get Kyushu dialects of Japanese from about here on up, and you get the Ryukyuan languages from about here on, on down. Um, <clears throat> there are um, uh, now, how many different Ryukyu languages are there? That depends on who you ask. Uh, generally speaking, um, the northern Ryukyu islands, each island has a different language, but they're mostly mutually intelligible if you make an effort. Um, however, when you get to Okinawa Irabu, it's not. Um, and then northern Okinawa has a particularly peculiar language. It's Japonic. Uh, some people are actually postulating that maybe it's that Mongol influence, but it's, we really can't say. It's just, it's just it's the, the Naki gene language. Um, there, there's, you know, just really quickly, there was even a case of like a mysterious ship that pops up here in, uh, in the 1700s, and the, the local officials send word down to Sherry that we can't understand the language of anyone on the ship. So they send some officials up to investigate, and the officials from Shuri not only can't understand the language of the people on the ship, they can't understand the local officials in Nakijin. Um, and uh, so um, you, that's why standard Japanese is what everyone uses, because that's really inconvenient to have to switch languages so often. And then down here is another set of Ryukyuan languages, which are Japonic, but they're not, they would not be intelligible if spoken uh, here. Um, so this is a case of... Um, uh, you, know, you could call them dialects if you wanted to, but if you take this... The, just the rough and ready rule of thumb that a dialect would be something that is, is at least partially intelligible, mutually intelligible. Uh, and if it's not in, intelligible at all, then it's a separate language. Like you could say English and Dutch are dialects, or German, but they're not. You know? So yeah, what about English and Frisian? Listen to Frisian sometimes. It's the closest language to English that isn't English. Um, and and uh, so, you know, so where do you exactly draw the line? But most will agree that the Ryukyuan languages, plural, you know, are, are languages that are in the Japonic family. And then the language of southern Okinawa, it's actually, there used to be two, but they've merged into one, uh, is there. And if you study it, I mean, if you, one of the things, I, I would sometimes play uh, some, some Okinawan uh, in a recording to uh, students. I sometimes give lectures to students in a university in Tokyo. And if this is the topic, I said, now let's listen to just a simple conversation in Okinawan. What, what are they struck by? It sounds like Korean. I was going to say, I don't, it just weirdly does, uh, you know, in, the, in these recordings. But, but it's, it's, you know, if, if you, um, um, uh, you know, if you study it, it's, it's, the words look really similar. You know, it's just like if you studied 
you know, German, Dutch, and English, you're going to see lots of words that look really, it's like, oh, that's, oh, that's, you know, but, but of course, it's, it's not similar enough to actually be mutually intelligible. So, a little bit about the linguistic situation. Yes? Professor, you just said that Liu Q was an empire rather than a national state, and we know that Liu Q has never been a national state. Then, do Liu Q people have a national identity? Nowadays in Okinawa, there's a group of people they want independence, and I'm wondering this kind of consciousness is a product of the gap between the official nationalism on mainland Japan and the local nationalism in Okinawa, or it's just a product of the UQ as a national identity. As you're saying this, I realize I usually bring along with me some, some additional slides of public opinion surveys. Forgot to do that. Um, uh, I always come armed with them when I'm in Hawaii because you know, the, uh, there's a group that always heckles my talks. And, and what you see from them is that you, you get asked a bunch of questions. Um, do uh, and one of them is should the Ryukyu Islands be independent? And usually the term is dokuritsu. And and. Uh, what do you think? What percentage of people living in the in Okinawa, usually it's just t taken in Okinawa, uh, would say that Okinawa and or other Ryukyu Islands should be independent? What do you think? Five, ten, twenty, forty, two, two, two. Yeah. So the folks in the Ryukyu Islands today are unproblematically Japanese, and that includes in Okinawa, up here in, in Omiyoshima. It's just yeah, you wouldn't even ask such a weird question. Um, the, um, there was a survey done in Okinawa Irabu asking, would you prefer to be in Kagoshima Prefecture or Okinawa Prefecture? And it was like half, most people said, we don't care. Uh, but, uh, so the, the number uh, who advocate independence is extremely small and very vocal. So give you some a little perspective. Now, there's a fairly big chunk, though, every time who uh, will answer, one of the questions is typically, uh, you, are you satisfied with the relationship between Okinawa and the central government? And about a third, or sometimes even more, will say no, that it's, you know, <coughs> central government, you know, they, they, they would complain about one thing or another. Uh, so you give a lot of people who are, you know, unhappy with, say, there's too many military bases or, or things like that, but they don't want, um, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to even imagine uh, what an independent you, you and and Okinawa and whatever it would look like in terms of economic viability and other kinds of things. Uh, so now, then the question of nationalism. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a tough one because that's such a complex uh, realm. I, um, as I said, I'm looking, I'm going to look closely at ethnogenesis. Um, we find that, and ethnogenesis could then mean any number of things. Uh, an outside group of people looking at the Ryukyu Islands and regarding them as an ethnic group, uh, or people in the Ryukyu Islands regarding either themselves or some subset of themselves as an ethnic group. And uh, among elite Ryukyu, the royal officials and such, with, I think that this, is gonna, this starts to happen in the 17th century, but it really gets going in the 18th where we have some actually explicit <laughs> descriptions of what it is to be Ryukyuan or what the Ryukyu Islands are. And, Things like that. But among, and then in the northern Ryukyu Islands, Ryukyu and ethnogenesis, I think, takes place differently and at different times than the, than the middle ones. That's another topic. But by the 19th century, so by the uh, mid 1800s or so, we have a, there, there's a very strong sense of that there are these people called Ryukyuans. Some people are and some people aren't. Although it's not always clear exactly who they are. Um, it's in, and you find this a lot in the northern Ryukyu Islands, where there are certain customs that, like the, the priestess of this shrine always has to be a Ryukyuan, and so, you know, a local person, basically. Um, it seems that in Okinawa, you, and this is kind of an interesting thing, and um, you get a sense of Okinawan or Ryukyuan identity is inculcated exactly at the same time and by the same process of inculcating a Japanese identity. So it's, in other words, it's in the 1880s, after the Ryukyu kingdom becomes part, it becomes made into Okinawa Prefecture, that essentially now you're going to school and you have the books and teachers are saying, 
you guys are now Japanese, and you're Ryukyuans. So stop acting like Ryukyuans and act like Japanese. You know, and you get this dual, uh, and, and uh, so my suspicion is that that's when we're going to, we find, we find ethnogenesis among ordinary people that late, uh, the 1880s. So I could be wrong. I have to, like I said, this is a future project I'm going to really look at thoroughly. Um, and, and then today, um, I just don't, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, like a, it's almost like a feeling or, or something. You, like, who do you hang out with and where do you go? I mean, I, when I go to these, uh, the Ryukyu Islands, I usually am actually going just for vacation. I do most of my work you know, right here, documents and archaeological reports and, and things like that. And, don't ever detect. I mean, my, I'm, all, I'm alert for it. My antennas are out for any sense of Okinawan nationalism, and it's 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 not zero. There are some people out there, but you really have to kind of know who they are and hang out with them and go drinking with them and so forth. And when it's the broader society, it just isn't. You know, people refer to themselves. We're Japanese, and they. You know, um, there isn't quite as much of a, this obsessiveness about Japanese, though. There, like if you, you know, other parts of Japan, it's often, you know, the word Japanese, Japanese, Japanese precedes like every object. And the Japanese podium, and the Japanese chair, and, the, and there's, that, that's much less here. So there's a little bit of a subtle scent difference. Sorry, I couldn't really answer your question with precision, uh, but I just kind of ma mapped out some of the, the terrain, I hope. Yeah. It's a kind of like China people, and now people are descendants from German people. How come now as like people are so different from Ainu? I mean, and the short answer is because they're not. That's the Hanihara hypothesis. Uh, you know, you're familiar with that term, the Hanihara. Oh. Okay, so it's a guy named Hanihara Kazuro, uh, physical anthropologist. And he proposed uh, that uh, the, and, and this actually comes from an older hypothesis. Uh, let me get that uh, final slide up. It'll make it a lot easier to explain. Um, so he proposed that uh, Jomon people from Kyushu, right, I've got to back up. So some of you may, um, you know, at least some of you know this, but some of you don't, that the, if you're looking at the origins of the, the Jap you know, the people who populated the Japanese islands. There are, we have these Jomon people, and they've been there as long as some would say 10,000 years. There's all these different dates on the Jomon era. Um, and then there are Yayoi people who come in from the Korean Peninsula uh, through northern Kyushu, and then they spread out. And it's these Yayoi people who bring uh, a lot of the pottery uh, and physical culture that comes later to be regarded as Japanese, and they're also going to bring the, the, the languages that will, you know, again, people argue about exactly which, how, which, and how it happened, but they're going to bring the Japonic languages. So it's these Yayoi people who come in and, you know, come in and then live with and maybe conquer or absorb or whatever the, the Jomon people, that makes Japan Japonic, you know, it's very simply stated. Um, so the this hypothesis that is very popular, very prominent, was that the Jomon people come into the Ryukyu Islands and Hokkaido. And that then the, uh, it's a little more complicated up in Hokkaido, uh, but uh, they will eventually become Ainu up in Hokkaido and they become Ryukyuans in the Ryukyu Islands. Now, I don't know about the Hokkaido situation, but the, it's this, this is what sinks that hypothesis in the Ryukyuan case. Um, We've got really good evidence that the, the, the folks who were living in, the, in Okinawa and northward, who were mostly of Jomon derivation, um, as well as the people in the southern Ryukyu Islands who were Austronesian, um, their populations precipitously decline uh, as we're coming in toward the 11th century. And, um, and then we have these waves for almost a century of northern people coming in, mostly Jap from the Japanese islands, but some Korea for reasons we've seen. And, um, and, and they swamp out this small population of uh, Jomon people. Now, did they, you know, kill them or did they just intermarry with a few of them who were there? Or, you know, we, we don't know, but uh, they, the, the number, the difference is, is, is huge. And this shows up very dramatically in DNA evidence and physical evidence and, 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 and so forth. Uh, that's why I've really emphasized this is a discontinuity. So that's partly why 
these two groups are so different, they aren't actually um, uh, uh, Jomon derived. Uh, there's a little bit of Jomon DNA coming out through here, but um, yeah. Uh, and that's the big the discovery of the Gusku era, uh, archaeologically and in other, in, from some other disciplines. Uh, Roughly in the, throughout the 1990s, that's so recent, uh, the Hanihara hypothesis comes along in the 1980s. So um, that's what really sinks it in the, the Okinawan case. So in the recent book, um, I talk about that at some length. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe one last question? Um, I'm curious to know how Okinawa is influenced by more southern South the countries like Taiwan, Southeast Asia. I know you talk mainly yes. about the relation to the Korea. Right. Yes. Uh, how the Okinawan culture? Because I think it is some language also influenced by the Indonesian, for instance. Um, that's um, that would be the Austronesian uh, impact. Uh, so in terms of language, we don't actually know. It would be fascinating to know. We just don't know what languages were spoken in the Ryukyu Islands prior to the, the Gusku era. Almost certainly in the southern Ryukyu Islands, it was some sort of Austronesian language. And the connections with Taiwan and the Philippines are many uh, in terms of archaeological evidence. Even things like tooth ablation. This is one of the weirdest things. I don't know why ancient peoples did this. They would yank out a healthy tooth. That would be so much fun. Um, but always the same tooth. You know, this group yanks out this tooth, and this group yanks out that one. And so that's a really great um, piece of physical evidence. Then we find skeleton, you know, a skull tooth out. There were all kinds of links between Taiwan, Okinawa, and Tanegashima, of all places, the, the Satsunan Islands. Um, and, and so there were. Uh, this is one of the things I argue is that the Austronesian peoples we're not limited only to the southern Ryukyu Islands. We can find through tooth ablation evidence uh, and all sorts of cultural evidence that go all the way up to the edge of Kyushu. Um, so um, there's a profound cultural influence of them, um, that, but uh, linguistically, I don't think, you know, again, not, we'd have to ask a linguist. There, okay, there, there are some linguists or anthropologists posing as linguists who have argued that um, certain place names in, um, uh, like say in Kagoshima, like uh, Ibuski, or Ijuin, or anything with an E is the first, you know, which is kind of an odd uh, sounding name, that that's Austronesian. There is some, some argument to that effect, but I can't really uh, evaluate it, I just don't have the, the knowledge of Austronesian languages. So yeah, there, there's some of that uh, uh, that we can find, although it's very, it's greatly muted uh, by this huge Japonic influx that happened in the 11th century. Can I ask a final um, loaded question? Okay. Um, so the, the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands have absolutely no physical, cultural evidence that would indicate whether they're part of the Ryukyu or not? Correct. Um, <laughs> here's the thing about them is, um, and this, this actually, I'm glad you got you. I think I can just basically briefly explain what's going on with them. I mean, of course, there's the modern situations going on with them, but these islands uh, were uninhabited. They are today, and they were, they were never inhabited. You, if you look at them, you can see why. They're just rocks. Um, and um, they, but they're also, they're dramatic rocks that rise out of the ocean. And I don't have the map here, but if you look on old maps, and they're on everybody's map. Because if you're going to go across from either Okinawa or our southern Ryukyu Islands across to, uh, to, to Fujian or somewhere in, in southern China, um, you can use these rocks just like the, the, the islands in the northern Ryukyus where you see one ahead of you and one behind you. You can use these rocks uh, for navigation purposes. As long as you hit those rocks and see them, then you know, you go that way and you'll go right into the area of China that you want to go. So, all the old Chinese maps have these rocks on them. All the old Japanese maps have the rocks on them. All the old Korean maps, they're on everybody's map because they were useful navigational aids. And therefore, uh, you know, a huge part of this argumentation is, you see, it's on our maps. Well, it's on their maps, too. And it's on everyone's maps for obvious reasons. Uh, so, but, you know, and, uh, at least we don't have to worry about, like, what people live there because 
we can safely say that maybe someone, you know, a poor shipwrecked soul died on one of these islands, but uh, they were always uninhabited. It would be nice if there was a way just to kind of sink them. <laughs> 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 <laughs>